This video is brought to you in part by Ewan Racing, makers of the ogre-sized Flash XL gaming chair that I'm sitting in right now doing the filming and editing. Use my affiliate link in the description and use coupon code KODOK to save up to 20% off. Previously on Kodok Tube. I've never heard of MetaZoo, though I've never met a zoo I didn't like. <laughs> uh, what we tried to send you didn't fit into the box, so expect something in the coming weeks. Welp. They weren't kidding. Hey everybody, this is Kodak here, and today we're going to take a look at MetaZoo, which is a trading card game about cryptids. Now, before we go on, I am aware about the whole... Stocks. And I will talk about that, but as my birthday video showed, I was on board to do a review of this game long before any of that happened. <laughs> I knew about MetaZoo before, it was cool. But yeah, they sent me a lot, so we should probably get into it. But first, you know, full disclosure, I've been talking with these guys for months. I backed their Kickstarter. The stuff you see here was sent to me for the purpose of review, and they've even bought a bit of ad space. But as fans of mine, they have asked me to give my honest opinion. And, uh... Also, again, this was all arranged before that whole stonks. MetaZoo is a trading card game where the goal is to reduce your opponent's life points to zero from their starting total of 1,000. You do this by channeling auras to cast spells and play powerful artifacts as well as form contracts with various cryptids such as Bigfoot, Mothman, the Flatwoods Monster, and Santa Claus. Because I guess Santa Claus is a cryptid now. A cryptid is a sort of a monster of legend that has had reported sightings in the post-Enlightenment era, where society has put things like dragons and unicorns firmly into the realm of fiction. If there were reported sightings or encounters with a strange creature within the past like hundred years or so, it probably counts as a cryptid. There are also other sorts of creatures such as yokai, which could be considered cryptid adjacent. The cryptids themselves are clearly a huge part of the game's appeal, not just to cryptid enthusiasts, but to anybody whose hometown has a similar sort of legend. It's the same with games like Mythos y Leyendas, and I know several people replied to my half-box opening who were thrilled to see their native folklore show up in a card game. And cryptids are sort of a fertile ground for this, seeing as stuff like gods and heroes and fairy tales have already been covered to death by games like Mythos. And Cthulhu. Cthulhu's been done to death too. Another thing that I'm sure you've noticed as well is that the cards have a really throwback design, with bright colored card frames and cartoonish designs rendered in watercolor, meant to invoke the look of the old Pokemon cards, which were often nothing more than Ken Sugimori's official artwork placed on top of stock backgrounds. The art itself is sort of hit and miss. While some of it does look a little bit clumsy, there are also artists that are clearly comfortable with the style. I mean, can you even look at Snow Snake's artwork and still have a shred of anger left in your body? Another thing worth noting is the card border. The original test printing and the Halloween promo set had black borders on their cards. But starting with the Christmas set, the border was changed to a bright candy apple red. This says it loud and clear. This game is supposed to be fun. These cards have red borders for the same reason Pokemon has a yellow border, to really embrace that throwback feeling it's going for. Although, even I admit the art on some of these cards can kinda clash with that image, particularly the ones with blood. I mean, yeah, it's certainly a choice to include some gore in this game, and I'd encourage them to maybe tone this back, considering it's a throwback kid-style game depicting cherished local icons. If you want to depict like a dangerous man-eating beastie, you can have them chewing on bones like a dog or something. Although, I have to admit, the card art for Old Green Eyes changes from pretty spooky to downright hilarious when you realize it's on a bright purple card with a candy red outline. I mean, if the contents of Hot Topic have taught us anything, it's that there's definitely a market for cute spooky. While the cards themselves look like ones out of Pokemon, it plays more like a combination of Magic the Gathering and the Versus system. You pay for cards with one of ten different kinds of Aura cards, which get played and then used like the land cards of Magic. Non-Aura cards enter play tapped or fatigued and can't be used until they are ready on their next turn. Like with the Versus system, your cryptids, or beasties as they are called in this game, can choose either your opponent or one of their beasties as an attack target, and any of their beasties can jump in the way of that attack, with the attacking monster inflicting breakthrough damage to their original target if they overcome the remaining health of their defenders. Otherwise, the defenders get to hit back with their own attack. Each attribute has a clear style. Leaf is all about swarm tactics, Fire is about buffing for huge damage, Electric is about speeding things up, and I'll give you one guess what the Ice attribute is all about. 
There's also a neat quirk with this game's version of artifacts. Each attribute basically gets its own zero-cost aura-generating Moxen-style card. However, you see that little number up there? That's an HP score. So yeah, while they work like the dreaded Moxen of the Power 9, they enter play tapped and can be smashed by creature attacks. Chaos Crystal may be a reusable Black Lotus, but it's also a bird that you can bolt. And every attribute gets a bolt. As for deck limits, an interesting mechanic this game has is that each card actually has its own limit listed on the top of the card. This can be as few as 1 or as many as 10 in your deck of 40. Stronger cards tend to have lower deck limits, such as Chaos Crystal or Mothman. It's sort of neat seeing a game that has both rare power cards and the opportunity to put in abundant minions. There are also status ailments in the vein of Pokemon, and several can be applied not only to beasties, but to players as well. Burn in particular is pretty nasty, as it inflicts 20 damage every time a beastie is fatigued to attack or use an ability, and if you burn a player, that happens every time they do that. However, with these, I have to talk a bit about the jank. And yes, there is jank. There are no fewer than 8 status ailments, all of which need tokens to remind about without much in the way of self-tracking elements outside of Burn's dice roll. A number of common concepts such as draw, hand, and deck are replaced by the oddball terms bookmark, chapter, and spellbook respectively. There are also two discard piles, and there are several keywords as well, although in this case listed as icons, which again need to be looked up. And there's also an element wheel where beasties deal more damage to beasties of certain types. This kind of thing is fine if it's put into a digital game which tracks all of this stuff automatically, but in a physical card game, those kinds of reminders really need to be on the card. For example, the game Battle Claw included the Wuxing bonus, a little number dropped down right below a monster's power score to indicate a bonus it gets when attacking a monster of that type. It's the kind of thing players will forget about half the time without the reminder being on the card. And yes, you will need counters, you will need dice, and the current iteration of the starter deck contains neither of those. I should probably do a video on the importance of self-tracking features and how they get designed. For a better example, Pokemon has just five status ailments and only two of them need tokens to remind you, with the rest rotating the card in a different direction. And for a card with a freezing effect, Exodus actually flips the card face down, flipping it face up at the start of the turn as it unfreezes. I guess there is the fact that through some sort of terrible misfortune you could inflict every single status ailment on one poor beastie, but it is still a bit much. Although, with all of this talk about jank, I kinda have to talk about the thing that's turning the most heads, and that is the star effects. That's been one of MetaZoo's big selling points is that the actual environment where you play the game can be taken into effect. For example, is it snowing outside? Did you take a car here? Is there a log somewhere with an eyesight? These are the fourth wall effects, and you know, I kinda get it? They're supposed to be like, weird creatures beyond human understanding, so of course they're subject to weird rules, but it also creates some unique turn interactions. Okay, so at the start of my turn, I'm going to put a light aura into play, and because it's December, I can use the effect of Gingerbread Man to heal Santa Claus back up to full. Not so fast. This piece of tin foil, which held the sandwich I had for lunch, means I can play the Metal Man of Alabama for one less electric aura. Clever, but I took Piazza Bird to a nice fireside dinner last night, increasing its attack power by 50 points. Oh yeah? Well, I'm not wearing pants right now. Yeah! This must be how it feels to be a normie watching a game of Yu-Gi-Oh. I'm divided on the concept of the fourth wall effect. On one hand, they're kind of fun and spontaneous. On another, they're sort of random. Some of them are simple, like asking if a player is wearing a jacket or if there's a radio nearby, or that have a player do something silly like hug the card or say a silly phrase. But others come across as a bit of a homework assignment, like an effect that only works in a location historically known for forest fires? There are also these marks on the left side of the card. These are fourth wall bonuses and increase the damage of a beastie's attack based, again, on things like it being nighttime, being near a forest, there being an active meteor shower, etc. Now, it's pretty clear that these mechanics could even mess up a casual game, let alone anything competitive, and there has been a push to make it so that this game operates a lot better in a vacuum. Otherwise, playing a rain deck in California would suck.
However, and this might be the toy-based game part of me talking, I think these fourth wall effects still have some fun potential. First of all, there are some cards that let you manipulate the play space. There are the Terra cards, which can be played for free and activate both the fourth wall bonus and related effects, such as the River Terra card allowing you to play River Dinos. There is also the card Wapalusi, where if any player has some sort of leather accoutrement like a belt, wallet, key fob, or shoes, it can, when played, generate a token beastie with whatever name you want. The card itself even says the name is allowed to activate fourth wall effects. For example, you could create a token named Paul Bunyan to activate the effects of Babe the Blue Ox, or Mirror to activate the effect of Deflection, or Mount Kilauea, an active volcano known for frequent forest fires and fallen trees that burn with an eyesight, to totally break a fire deck. Yeah, I don't feel like the fourth wall ability should be nerfed or eliminated or anything like that, but I feel that they should be made easier and more fun to play around with, even if the only things that matter gameplay-wise are what the players themselves bring to the table regardless of where they're playing. Heck, if it were up to me, I might even munchkin it up a little bit and have some official MetaZoo merchandise that allows players to set off various fourth wall effects on their own. I mean, come on. Like I said before, this game is supposed to be fun. I don't expect this game to have, like, really tight competitive play, and it's clear that the collectible element with that splash of throwback joy and a bit of wackiness is what I've seen as the big selling point. The current block of sets is going to take place in the United States, but future blocks will travel to other places around the world, so other cryptids like Nessie and Hanako-san will get cards in the future. I've even heard rumors that they're in talks with various cryptid museums to make special cards that can be sold only at those locations. Although, on the subject of sales, I guess it's time to talk about squawks. So first, a bit of history. MetaZoo started off as a small-scale project with a run of just 2,500 special K-printed booster boxes, coupled with a Kickstarter campaign that existed less to fund the game and more to drum up interest and support. It stayed on this low level for a while, where after this print run got delayed, they kept interest by giving away some of the Black Border test prints of the cards, as well as special small sets based on Halloween and Christmas that could be rushed out while the delay dragged on. But then... Finally, the print run rolled off the presses and was shipped out to the Kickstarter backers, which included me. And then Rudy got a box. What's going on? And the speculative market went insane. Yes, the same apparatus that drained Target of all of its Pokemon cards and caused flesh and blood boxes to cost thousands of dollars started seeking out this special K-stamped first run and the prices ran spiraling out of control. I honestly didn't see this coming. A lot of people did not see this coming. MetaZoo themselves did not see this coming. I mean, what they wanted were for people to buy the packs to, you know, open and play with them, not put them on ice to try to make them cost thousands of dollars to keep them out of the hands of regular folks. I mean, before all of this went down, I'd already opened three of my booster boxes, and no, the fourth one isn't for sale. And to be fair, MetaZoo's response to this whole thing is to try and play around the people flipping the product. The Kickstarter ship has kinda sailed, so their second run of the base set, printed without the K-stamp and featuring a number of errata and printing fixes, will not only be 10 times the size of the Kickstarter run, but up until release they plan to allow people to make limited pre-order purchases at suggested retail price directly from them through drops that open a percentage of the run. The first pre-order, allowing just 20% of it, sold out in 24 hours. So yeah, the K-Stamp stuff will still be special and limited, but it won't be the only way to get the cards for long. Behind the game is somebody who really cares about making a fun product and getting that product to those people who want to open and play with them, and you can see that in what they are offering. They all have special overwraps and foil seals and a bunch of other little things that give the product a nice feel. I'll keep it brief here because I plan on doing unboxings of all of this product at some point. Booster boxes have 36 packs, there's also a half box in the style of an Elite Trainer box that has 10 packs, some sleeves, a coin, and an exclusive Cryptid Nation card. There are currently decks in half the available attributes, which include exclusive cards, a sealed extra copy of the deck's boss monster, and a set of sleeves which will be swapped for a bonus booster pack in the later editions. On the subject of card sleeves, the packaging of the decks can actually stash the entire decks in sleeved. It's always the little things. And finally, the Target-style blister packs which come with a pack, a special coin, and a limited edition Mothman foil promo card. 
Ah, uh, by the way, on the subject of deck limits, it goes sort of by the Digimon rule, where things like collector number or stats or artwork are the limiting factor, rather than the name, so you could run both the regular Mothman and the promo Mothman in your deck at the same time. The other merch I have here is actually getting phased out. With the sudden uptick in popularity of MetaZoo, they're actually switching over to selling the merchandising rights to companies that can do it better and more cost-effectively. There are going to be higher quality playmats and other things in the near future, as well as a fan art set featuring a few new cards and alternative artworks for the Aura cards. Which is good, because it's really hard to stockpile Auras right now. More on that in the unboxing. For retailers, they're offering pretty good margins for those who adopt early and have a countertop display included with a decent order. I've got a pretty good mock-up here for how it would look when it's all set up. So yeah, I have some unboxings planned. I'm going to use the booster box that I've set up as a display model here because I've already opened it. And I'm uh, going to do one of the spell books in one of the decks, maybe the, the darkness or the frost deck. But uh, if there's something I haven't mentioned in this video or didn't really talk about, it's probably because I'm saving those for those unboxings. So that's my take on MetaZoo. Strange? Yes. Clunky? Oh, definitely. But I feel like it's leaning into that absurdity. Like I've said, I doubt there's going to be an intense competitive scene unless there's a big rollout of additional rules or something. That said, I think it's neat to have a game that's just sort of stupid fun, and I hope this element is what gets worked out more in the future. As long as they continue to lean into that absurdity and invoke a bit more of the culture of cryptid hunting, I think it can remain a special little thing for some time. So yeah, that's MetaZoo. I'm gonna crank out those unboxing videos real quick and uh, we're gonna have some fun and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see some more in the future. We'll uh, also have that fan art set to look forward to. And uh, so yeah, until next time, this is Kodak signing off.